INSEAD Leaders Forum, our podcast series or leader cast series, where we will welcome leaders from around the world to talk about the topic of uh, leadership. My name is Charles Galenick. I'm the Dean of the Executive MBA. And today it's a pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Mr. Henri Dominique Petit from the Baco Dallos Group. Mr. Petit, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Great. Um, I thought we'd start off by talking about uh, leadership more, more broadly. And the mm -hmm. problem with leadership is it's too broad. <laughs> it's one of these topic areas that, uh, uh, that is full of traits and characteristics and behaviors. Um, and so it's tough, tough to generalize about. What I'd ask you, first of all, is what two or three characteristics would you highlight as being the most important in your experience and in your context, uh, given the kind of uh, work that Baku de Laws does? What two or three characteristics are particularly important for effective uh, leaders? I think in our case, it's uh, especially important to look at the characteristics of the leaders, uh, because we are in a kind of a cultural change effort. Uh, we have spent quite a lot of time to try to define what we mean by leadership characteristics. And I have to say that they don't apply only to the CEO or even what I would call the top executives, but also to everybody who has to lead in the company. And these are managers, but also in some cases experts who have to lead by influence. By, because they manage big projects, and more and more these projects are transversal, and then you need to develop your leadership skills in that context. So we are using these characteristics, uh, obviously, to judge the capability of the people to lead larger teams, for example, or when we decide to uh, uh, hire people from outside, uh, we need to have a common uh, reference. Uh, uh, so a, a framework of reference about these leadership characteristics. And these characteristics have to be in line with the culture that we try to uh, develop. Okay, so you push it down. It's not just about the top leadership. You push it down uh, lower into the organization. But what two or three things are, are particularly important uh, to and you? So in this context, the, the first one that is most important for us at this moment is building bridges across the organization. Uh, this ability, and this is something which has been undersold, in my opinion, when, when people talk about leadership. Because uh, when you are uh, a young, relatively young company like us, uh, result of a merger of two companies which have done in the previous years a lot of acquisitions, there is not a lot of habits to work uh, in a big, uh, bigger environment. So people were accustomed to work with one charismatic leader on following this person and not thinking about the big picture in, the, in, in that company. So, this ability to work in a transversal way, to work uh, in, uh, in, uh, in processes which have to encompass the whole uh, chain, business chain, is very important. So building these bridges is the first characteristic that we develop. And we are reinforcing it somewhat by two of the processes that we have emphasized. One is supply chain management, which goes again, goes across most of the functions. And the second one is product commercialization, okay, where also needs a lot of collaboration. So the processes if we are reinforcing, if you wish, the culture by, by itself. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me move up uh, the scale a little bit and focus specifically now on the role of a senior executive or, or CEO. Uh, how do you feel the, the job of a CEO uh, has changed in the last uh, two decades, decade or two? Has there been a significant difference or is the job of the CEO basically the same as it's always been? Uh, obviously, uh, I was not CEO 20 years ago, so I would be humble in my answer, but I think there are three characteristics that I would feel are, have, are more important today than there were uh, 20 years ago. The first one is the fact that now, for a company, the market is global. And really global, and especially the importance of emerging markets have grown up, I mean, tremendously. Everybody's talking about China, now it's India, but 
you would say the same thing about Russia or Brazil. I mean, the BRIC countries are very important now. And this is not something that was so important in the past. People would think about their local market in Europe, their home, home market, plus perhaps the rest of Europe, and if they were lucky, the United States, and that's it. Okay? So no, no, really a new dimension in that respect. Second one is the complexity of things. I mean, the, uh, the fact that uh, you are working on a more global uh, scale, but also, as we just talked, but also the fact that the techno technologies have changed and that uh, the, they are changing faster, if you wish. Uh, the fact that uh, the, even the way you, uh, uh, you develop your people, you have to develop your people, the way you have to deal with more stake stakeholders for a company, uh, environmental concerns have grown, for example. All these kind of issues make in my opinion, the job of the CEO more complex because you are going in m many directions. The last one is something that everybody is talking about, is the speed of change. I mean, clearly, things are changing very, very fast and faster. So as a consequence, you have to be more agile. And I think it makes the things more difficult because you cannot count on your old reflex in order to act. You have constantly to try to learn and to be humble in that respect and to understand what you don't know and why things are changing so fast. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're going to scare off some people from uh, taking on this position. Uh, <laughs> this what, is not my purpose. <laughs> one thing that, uh, that we found that the media has pushed this, uh, I think, a fair amount is that in the 80s it was the, the age of the charismatic leader. Um, you had to be on the front cover of various magazines uh, and newspapers and so on to be really uh, seen as leading your company in the 90s uh, as, as well, uh, perhaps even more. But in the new millennium, we've had a pushback, it seems, towards these uh, the charismatic CEO type. Do you have any thoughts or reflections on that? Is this just a slight blip, and we're going to go back to uh, more of the same? Or I, I mean, I'm I'm not sure if it will come back to the old things, but I think in my mind, char charisma has been oversold as a leadership uh, characteristic because. One person cannot do it alone. And what you have to build is to build leaders below, if you wish, the CEO, who themselves are able to uh, create excitement and uh, uh, an emotional engagement for the company. Okay? And you need relays to do this. The, the CEO cannot do it alone. With this complexity of things, you don't create excitement the same way in China with young Chinese very eager to work uh, versus uh, some people in the Western world who could be more tired, if you wish, uh, quote unquote, or uh, motivated less by learning and new adventures and more by uh, looking at more intellectual strategic issues. You have to customize far more sure. what, what you do in that respect, and you cannot do it alone. Your, your top executives have to do it with you, and even their direct report as well. Okay, so it comes back to cascading that personal, interpersonal uh, approach, uh, engaging with people, getting them hot. Ab and, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think this is key, and that's, uh, in my opinion, a, a significant change in that respect versus what was taught perhaps 20 years ago. And, what was emphasized by the, the magazines. Okay, what do you think will be the future? Uh, will there be any uh, change in the next decade or two? Uh, the year 2015, do you, do you foresee any major changes in how a CEO or chairman of a company uh, would have to do their job? Uh, I don't know if it's a, a big change, but I would say the emphasis in my mind, even if I'm not the, a forecaster, and I'm not looking at trends. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in a, in a very si scientific way, but I, I, I think developing talents uh, will be uh, very, very important. In developing your organization and the way this organization is able to learn, I mean, will become more and more important. And you will, in this, in a global world again with a bigger importance of emerging markets and as a 
consequence of leaders coming from emerging market, being member of your top leadership team, that will require, I mean, a lot of flexibility in the mind of the CEO to understand uh, these differences and how to deal with them. And also, I think the needs of the professionals and the needs of the, of the leaders are becoming more diverse. So the one solution fits all in terms even of rewards, but I mean basically in terms of motivation, uh, will become more and more, in my opinion, uh, more and more divergent. And we see it today, and I think this trend will continue at least for a while. There could be a backlash because too individualized is chaos, right? right? But uh, he, the CEO will have to understand that and to deal with it, in my opinion, uh, in, a, in a more, uh, I mean, to be more attuned to this kind of, uh, to this kind of issues. The, the second one is, I think, the uh, understanding the trends is something that we have to do every day, but it will be more and more difficult. Uh, it will be true in terms of technology because there will be more and more disruptive technologies. I've been struck by the work of Professor Christiansen in that respect. I mean, it's 10 years ago already, so I'm, a, I'm sure that a lot of people have embellished <laughs> the theory. But I think this idea of disruptive technology that you don't see coming and you are surprised by when you lead a big company is something that will happen more and more. But how do you stay attuned, uh, being, being yeah. so far above yeah. The groundworks where, where things are actually happening. How do you stay in touch with okay. the trends and things that are happening? How does a CEO do that? Okay, there are two kind of I mean two kind of things in that respect. The first one is, I think, uh, as a CEO, what is important is to touch people at different levels of the organization. Uh, you have to keep time to speak with people who are far lower in the organization because they will help you to understand. How the, I mean, how the culture is changing and how the organization is learning. Okay? And you cannot count only on the direct reports because they filter your organization. Okay? That is for what I would say the first part. For the technology part, uh, you have to, uh, in my opinion, push people in your organization to be alert on this kind of issues. You cannot do it by yourself. Okay? You have to. Uh, if you wish, push people to be alert, to react, and to have the proper forum to exchange on these issues and listen to the people who are perhaps the, the ones which are not in the common thought process of the company. People who are somewhat outside of the mainstream of thoughts and to be attuned to that. But you cannot do it by yourself. This is a cascading issue again. Okay? The, the, the issues for, for a CEO is to be sure that you, you, uh, you help the, 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 the managers, the leaders below you to develop these skills for you. Kind of. let, let me extend this a little bit. And this, I think, touches upon the things that you've been doing uh, directly with uh, Baku Delors, which is around culture and culture change. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, getting people to be more innovative and creative, bringing up knowledge is, is one way in, in which you might want to uh, touch culture and influence skills. But when we're talking more broadly about melding a culture, or mm -hmm. in your case a merger, where we had two mm -hmm. components come together, right. um, the, the general question is how does a CEO, again, right. who is in the helicopter, who right. is several levels above, um, what are some of the tools that you do use to try to influence the software, people's thinking, how they think on a daily basis about the routines, what they're supposed to do, what's important, what's not, and so on. What are some examples that you can give and uh, okay. from your experience? The, yeah, and in fact, we have practiced, and as this was the main issue for my company, I have personally spent a lot of time on this issue on how to do it, okay? And what I felt was the best possible way if I could. The first one is to have a visible agenda. You have to make the, the agenda visible. Okay? Because at the beginning, people don't believe that the problem is the culture. So you have to make it, them realize that changing the culture will make a difference for the problem that the 
company has. The second one is that you have to be a role model in, the, in this respect. If you ask people to uh, internalize some values, you have to practice them absolutely flawlessly. Okay? And that is an issue. In the, same, in the same vein, you have to convince your executive team to work according to these values in their interaction. And when companies have problems, generally, this is a significant issue. So spending time on being sure that the executive team is a role model is, in my opinion, absolutely paramount because this is the first thing that people will, will, will see, even more than you, if you personally, again. The, the fourth one is, is to, I think, define the two or three key processes, which are operational processes, which will help you to reinforce the, the values that you want to be embedded in your culture. And, and to create in a kind, the kind of the virtuous circle. That means because you have two processes which require these values, they reinforce the values. But in turn, because the values are well practiced, they improve the quality of the processes. And this is reinforcing. It, so, and you create this virtual circle that I was talking about. The last point I want to say is this is not a short-term plan. So uh, my next question is how long does this take? Yeah, this is and it takes, okay, it, it takes a long time. You are talking in years. You are not talking in months. You have to be very clear about your agenda and to have visible results and on the low-hanging fruits very clearly the first year. No doubt about that. And I think we have achieved this path. The most difficult part is to make it, I mean, a real change in depth. In that respect, the efforts are at different levels. I mean, you have to act on your executive team, as I said, and to cascade through very intensive communication what you do, but you have to be sure that you create mechanism to change the culture also at lower level. In our, ca in our case, we have created a, pro a program that we call ambassadors which are, in fact, the ambassadors of this culture. And they are uh, the leaders of small teams of, at each level of the, of, of, the, um, of the company working on what kind of change do we need, a uh, practical thing that we will do to make sure that we have this culture change. Okay? And we are the, in the second year of this program. Yeah, they sound more like disciples or, or apostles of the, of the religion, of uh, getting the values out. Uh. Exactly, exactly. They are disciples, and they, it plays both ways because they are also uh, extracting the problems and feeding back to the management team, the executive, the issues that they see on the ground. And these constant interactions uh, between you trying to say, hey, these are the issues that are the most important of the company, and them saying, hey, this is how the ground is saying it, and, and the people are willing to work on it, and these are the kind of changes that will make a difference at our level, That's, that is uh, very key. And the last point I wanted to say in that respect is communication, communication, communication. Okay? This requires a lot of energy around a very in-depth communication at all levels and cascading all the communication on all aspects, the business aspect, but also the uh, cultural uh, change that you want to, uh, uh, to drive. Great. Thank you for that. It's fascinating. One final question. How do you find time, or is this important to you, to regenerate yourself as a leader? Meaning, how do you find time, or what do you do to try to uh, restoke your motivation uh, sometimes even the confidence of a CEO may be uh, a little bit withered. To build that up again, to increase your knowledge, what are some of the things that, uh, that you do? I think what is very dangerous for a, a CEO is to be monodimensional. That means to think work day and night. I think to have a family or family-like uh, kind of a strong interest, to rejuvenate your your energy and to look at things in a different angle is very important. And one hobby with it or two, depending on the time and what kind of hobby it is, I think this is, this is key not to be burned out. The, 
the, the second one is, in my case, I am always trying to learn by observing. So I will observe by understanding how companies are, other companies in very different markets from mine, are succeeding or not. And trying, in, when there is a concept, I like to, under, to understand what this kind of concept will mean for me. I will not read a book, I will read only the, the half page describing the book and what kind of concept it is. And generally it's very well done and trying to say, okay, how does it apply to me? What kind of a lesson? And I am very strong on lesson learned. I am forcing each year the manager when they start the budget process by what are the key learnings of last year? What have you learned and what, what will you make different as a consequence of it? And I'm trying to apply this for me. But I go further. I am trying also to understand and think that, I mean, from a political situation and things like this, I can, I'm personally interested in politics, I mean, to understand it. Not to participate in it, but to understand it and to understand the why and things like this. Because I think it forces you as an exercise and saying, hey, uh, this is kind of things that could change because of it, from one side. And two, this is a, these are situations where what, what you thought was true one day, six months after, is, is, is no more the case. I mean, look at the popularity of some of the leaders, right? I mean, six months after, it's very different. Why? What has happened that the population has changed its mind? This kind of exercise is very important. And the last point is meeting people at all levels of the organization, I think is very rewarding. When you visit a factory, when you meet people in customer service in your area and you talk with them about what they are doing and how proud they are about what they do, I think and you feel that, I mean, there is a life, if you wish, which is very, very uh, uh, different from what you see from the top in that respect. From the top, you see only the problems. I mean, people come to you about the problems and what to solve. When you are on the ground, you see that people are more passionate than you think, providing they have the way to express it. So it's always a kind of a, I mean, regeneration, I feel always far uh, more uh, enthusiastic about my work, my own work, after this kind of uh, visits or even discussions in a corner. Great. Mr. Petit, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you.